Welcome back for the Welcome back for the presentation of the last full paper prepared for this year's Jackson Hole Conference on communication in the beliefs of economic agents presented by Professor Yuri Gorodnachenko from UC Berkeley. Yuri, now that Nick has left us even more worried about what's next for the global economy, I look forward to learning more about inflation expectations and how they could be used differently by central bankers to become a more important tool for monetary policy and to support the economy. The screen is yours, Yuri. Okay, thank you for putting this paper on the program and thank you for the introduction. This is joint work with Bernardo Candier and Olivier Corbion. And in this paper, we are motivated by a perennial question for central bankers. How can you stimulate the economy when conventional ammunition is not available, when you can't lower interest rates any further? And specifically, how can you use communication-based policies such as forward guidance and similar tools to help the economy? Now, to answer this question, you have to really understand how economic agents form their expectations, how households, firms, professional forecasters, uh, financial markets, how they come up with their beliefs and how they use these beliefs in their uh, daily lives. Now, in this context, we would like to highlight two challenges for effective policy communication. The first challenge is that unlike forecasters and financial markets, the general public, which includes households and managers, are much less informed about uh, the structure of their economy, the state of their economy, central banks and their policies. And in a way, this is great. This is a sign of success. Inflation doesn't really matter for daily lives of the general public, and we should celebrate this. But on the other hand, this kind of situation creates special challenges for effective policy communication, because people are so inattentive to what the central banks are doing and saying, we have to penetrate through this veil of inattention if we want to reach out to the general public. That's the first challenge. The second challenge is that we really have two types of agents in the economy. On the one hand, we have financial markets and we have uh, professional forecasters. On the other hand, we have the general public, which is households and firms. And those, these two different types of agents have a very different interpretation of what inflation is and how it's related to the rest of the economy. Let me give you an example. This figure here shows the evolution of beliefs uh, for professional forecasters in the US. The horizontal axis shows one year ahead expected inflation. The vertical axis shows the perceptions of the current state of the economy, the now cost for GDP growth rate. And you should see from this figure that just before the COVID crisis started, we had a very healthy situation. We had 2% inflation expected in the next 12 months. Uh, professional forecasters predicted the economy is going to expand, expand at 2% per year. But as the cost unfolds, we see that they dramatically revised their perceptions of the current state of the economy down. And at the same time, they revised their beliefs of expected inflation. So the bad state of the economy today is associated with uh, low inflation in the future. Now, when you do something like this for households, you see a very different picture. This data are from the Michigan Survey of Consumers. On average, before the crisis started, we see that households expect a higher rate of inflation. And that's a generic pattern. It's not specific to the US. We see that in advanced economies with low and stable inflation, households tend to predict much higher rates of inflation than professional forecasters do. But more importantly, uh, we see that as households started to revise their beliefs of the current state of the economy down, they started to increase, not lower, their inflation expectations. So it's very clear from this figure that the same sequence of events was interpreted differently by professional forecasters and uh, uh, households. They have very different interpretation of inflation. Now, to get some deeper insight in why households have this very different interpretation, it is useful to look at other data. And to this end, we use another survey, this time from the Cleveland Fed, which asks households to report how they change their behavior in response to the COVID crisis, and also what kind of rate of inflation they expect to see in the next year. This figure here shows that in response to the COVID crisis, households rise their inflation expectations up. That's the black line. There. At the same time, many, many households said that in, because of the COVID crisis, 
they started to save more, so they consume less. And from this commitment of the series, we can conclude that households associate high inflation with a time where you don't want to spend. It's not a good time to buy a durable good, or even maybe not durable goods. When you look at other survey responses, you see a similar uh, picture. That is, when inflation is high, people have elevated fears of losing a job. This is also the time when uh, many households report that they started to hoard more uh, food and, and medical supplies. So it's very clear that households associate uh, high inflation with terrible economic outcomes, with terrible economic outcomes. And uh, this is not specific to COVID. You can look at other countries, you can look at other times, you can make other cuts of the data. It's going to be more or less the same everywhere. Let me give you a few examples. This figure here shows the distribution of beliefs that professional forecasters have in general about future output and expected inflation. And what you should see here is that if you take a cross-section of professional forecasters in a point in time, and you take a professional forecaster who believes that inflation is going to be above the average, what is predicted by other professional forecasters, this professional forecaster is also going to predict that economy is going to expand at above average growth rate of output. Right, so we have a very strong positive movement association between expected inflation and expected output growth rate. In a way, this suggests to us that professional forecasters believe that the U.S. business cycles are driven by demand-side shocks, and there is some type of Phillips curve out there. Now, this is, again, not specific to U.S. You can look at other advanced economists. You can look at consensus economics, prof survey professional forecasters. This pattern is going to be there over and over again. Now, similar to what I showed to you before, when you do the same exercise for households, you see a very different, a very different pattern. For example, you look at uh, households participating in the Michigan survey of consumers, and you look at the cross-section of these households, and you pick a household that predicts above average inflation. This household is also going to predict below average economy in the future, right? So now instead of positive correlation, we see a negative correlation. Households think high inflation is bad for the economy. And again, this is not specific to the U.S. You can look at other data, other countries. For example, in the paper, we report some results based on the new ECB survey of consumer expectations, and you see exactly the same negative correlation for Italy, for Germany, for Spain, or other Eurozone countries. So this is not specific to the U.S. It seems to apply, it seems to, apply to uh, a broad range of advanced economies. Now, obviously, this is a correlation, and we should be careful when we interpret these results. But we also know from randomized controlled trials that if we pick at random a group of households and give these households a piece of information that is going to lead them to origin expectations up, this group of households is going to spend less on durable goods relative to a control group. So it seems this is not just a, a correlation. There is some causal relationship uh, behind, this, um, the, behind this figure. What is the significance of this? Well, if we want to raise inflation expectations, as we often do in our sort experiments, this policy can backfire. That is, instead of stimulating consumer spending, we can make it fall. Um, though, so that's very important for kind of practical uh, communication of policy. Now, the next thing we should want to check is what is uh, the situation for firms? Where are they in the spectrum alone, uh, professional forecasters and households? And they happen to be somewhere in between. The correlation between the economy and inflation is weaker, but we know from randomized controlled trials that at least in some instances, you raise exogenously expectations of firms, and these firms, instead of hiring more people and doing greater investments, are going to cut their investment and lower their employment. So we have to be very careful how managers interpret uh, inflation expectations. Now, where does this leave us? We can offer three lessons. The first lesson is that because the general public is so uninformed about central banks and their policies, if we want to have effective communication, our messages have to be very simple and relatable for the general public. They have to understand what the central bankers are talking about. This is the only way to pierce, to penetrate through this veil of inattention. The second lesson, or I should say, is that effective uh, communication should 
probably focus on promoting a holistic view of policy. That is, the simple messages should speak jointly about uh, inflation and employment outcomes to make sure that the public does not misinterpret whatever is uh, suggested by uh, policymakers. And in the end, the third lesson is that our effective, uh, hopefully effective, uh, policy and communication should uh, perhaps focus on policy objectives rather than instruments. And it's very easy for the general public to get confused about uh, inflation, interest rates, nominal versus real quantities. It's very easy to get lost in the details of monetary policy communication. Uh, but if we communicate to the public that our policies are here to promote, to deliver full employment and stable prices, the general public is much more likely to interpret these messages in the, in the correct way and act in the desired direction. Thank you. Thanks very much, Yuri. One of the last times that I heard you present at a conference of central bankers on related research, your results were quite controversial. Uh, there was even an intervention from Chairman Draghi from the ECB, where he had a very different interpretation of how to interpret your results. So I have the feeling that this latest set of results will also generate quite a bit of conversation. For those of you who would like to chime in, the call in number will show up in the stream in about five minutes. But in the meantime, George, Mario, and Jolitos from MIT will start us off. The screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction and uh, for the opportunity to discuss this very nice paper. Uh, uh, the authors of this paper, along with other collaborators, are leaders in a recent and growing empirical literature on macroeconomic expectations. Uh, in this paper, they draw uh, both from uh, previous work of their own, from work of others, but also they bring in new evidence uh, towards uh, delivering uh, certain key lessons for central bank communication. They focus in particular on the question of how communicating information about inflation, how it's likely to affect spending decisions by consumers and expectations of income, expectations about where the economy is going. More specifically, they will go ask whether higher expectations of inflation correlate with higher spending decisions by the consumers or higher expectations of inflation. Uh, excuse me, of higher expectations of income, better expectations about where the economy is going. Uh, some of the key findings are going to be the following. First, when we look at professional forecasters, it is true that high expectations of inflation correlate with higher expectations of uh, uh, income and growth in the economy or lower expectations of unemployment. In this sense, it is as if uh, uh, the for professional forecasters are operating over a field case in their mind where they're trying to predict when they where the economy is going. When they expect inflation to be high, they also expect economic activity to be high, as in the case where uh, uh, the variation in inflation and uh, growth over the business cycle is driven by demand shocks. However, if we turn the focus to consumers uh, and to also to managers of firms, we tend to see the opposite relation. There's evidence both that consumers who expect higher inflation tend to spend less. So in that sense, they associate uh, 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 higher inflation with bad news about the economy, bad news about how much they spend. And also, when we solicit expectations from consumers or managers about uh, the economy, again, they tend on average uh, to associate higher inflation with bad news about the economy. As if in the case where uh, 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 the business cycle, economic activity is driven by supply shocks rather than by demand shocks, and as if you have an inverted Phillips curve point. This may not be totally surprising. What is interesting, though, it may not be totally surprising precisely because even our models, depending on whether we're thinking about supply or demand shocks, our models are going to predict different relations. Uh, between expectations of inflation and expectations of uh, income and unemployment. But it's also interesting to note that there is this 
difference about how the professional forecasters think about the economy and how the consumers and the firms think about the economy. And to the extent that central bankers are interested in shaping the expectation and the behavior of the consumers and firm, it is very important evidence provided in this paper that if you communicate to consumers a, a, a commitment uh, to have higher inflation, this could potentially backfire because the consumers and the firms may interpret this as bad news about the state of the economy or the prospects of the economy rather than as commitment for uh, uh, lax monetary policy. I also want to know that uh, this is not necessarily inconsistent with macroeconomic data. If you ask whether positive innovations in inflation predict higher or lower economic activity, you find exactly the opposite of a Phillips curve, or you find what you will, our models will predict in the, cost, uh, in the case of uh, cost per shock and supply shock, that, higher, that positive innovations in inflation predict uh, higher unemployment and lower growth. Okay? So in that sense, at least if you take a snapshot of the macroeconomic time series, it seems to be that the consumers and the firms get it right, and the professional forecasters maybe get it wrong. Yeah. Uh, but let me now move to something more important for uh, uh, like my take-home lessons for uh, 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 policy communication, for the demand communication. Uh, and I want to emphasize that in the context of uh, uh, modern macroeconomic policy, and by modern I mean after the great moderation, after uh, in the post-Volker era and so on, it's not surprising that people do not, uh, uh, that real world people, consumers and firms, do not think in terms of a Phillips scale. First of all, inflation in the minds of people is not a serious concern. Why it's not a serious concern? Well, this is thanks to a large extent because of modern central bank policies that have managed to stabilize inflation against uh, fluctuations in real economic activity. So in some sense, inflation has become largely noise over the business cycle. Uh, again, thanks to central bank policies. And once this is the case, it's reasonable that people pay very little attention to what's happened to inflation and that their behavior is not going to be particularly sensitive to expectations of inflation. Furthermore, this is not just a statement about how maybe people are thinking, but maybe also how central bankers and economists should think. Inflation is not a reliable indicator of either output gaps or aggregate demand over modern middle cycles. In terms of our theory, this is either because the Phillips curve has become extremely flat, or maybe perhaps it's wrong, maybe it's not a relevant representation of modern middle cycles. Let me just be clear that saying that the Phillips curve is very flat or that there's disconnect between inflation and real economic activity or even being more erratic and claiming that the Phillips curve uh, is wrong, this doesn't negate either the power of monetary policy to control the economy or the role of aggregate man in a driving business cycle. In all the questions, the, que in all the, questions, the usefulness of the concept of the Phillips curve for understanding the majority of business cycles, and more importantly, for gauging policy communication. And here, let me move to the next one. Let's think how communication has been framed, both in this paper and in previous uh, uh, academic and policy literature. And I want you to think about the question of whether the central bank should uh, communicate a commitment to raise inflation. In our, new in our models, a commitment to raise inflation stimulates aggregate demand via two channels. A partial equilibrium channel, which is that unless nominal interest rates are just enough, expectations of higher inflation map to expectations of lower real interest rates. And lower interest rates, through a partial equilibrium effect, are supposed to stimulate demand. But on top of that, there's an important general equilibrium feedback. That when you are expecting, because of lax monetary policy or because of lower interest rates, uh, the others in the economy to spend, then through the familiar Kings and Cross plus the Phillips curve, you're expecting as others are spending more, the economy will boom, unemployment will be low, and this is a general curve of feedback that helps further stimulate aggregate demand. That's the basis of the logic within our model why, we should, why a commitment to raise inflation should stimulate the economy. 
But the real world may be far from that for a number of reasons. First of all, real world people may have trouble translating high inflation to lower real interest rates. And that's precisely what the evidence in this paper speaks to. It's told that expectations of inflation seems to, uh, expectation of high inflation seems to be uh, uh, associated with lower spending, presumably because uh, uh, people think of that as a, a reduction in their income, not as an improvement in the rate of return. Furthermore, as I said, a lot of the impact of communications of, uh, of a commitment to raise inflation comes from a general column effect. But in the real world, people may have difficulty to understand this general equilibrium consequence, either because they're not fully rational, or because they have, don't have a perfect understanding of how the economy works, or most simply because they haven't read economic textbooks and they don't even know what the new Keynesian model is. Okay? So the bottom line from this is that uh, uh, perhaps when central banks are trying to talk to the general public, they should not obsess about communicating uh, uh, their intentions about inflation, but instead they should talk about the things that people care and understand most easily. They should talk about output growth, about unemployment. They should talk about jobs rather than about inflation. This is something we have formalized in work, uh, and I'm not going to have time to talk on that, uh, but let me also finish with this. Now, they should talk about algo, they should talk about the economy, but they should also talk in simple, crisp, and constructively imprecise ways, such as in the famous uh, uh, way that Marius Draghi said, commitment to do whatever it takes, as opposed to very detailed, cautious, and uh, uh, perhaps holistic approaches that may confuse people. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. As expected, we have a nice queue of people who would like to comment on these presentations. Uh, on my list, I have Constance Hunter, Diane Swank, Francois uh, from the Bank of France, Alan Blinder, Jose de Gregorio, um, and that's it for now. So well, our Kansas City team teased that up. I just wanna ask a quick question. Uh, Yuri, you show this very interesting divergence in terms of how COVID has infected or affected inflation expectations for different groups. For example, you show that professional forecasters expect the current pandemic to cause inflation to fall along the lines of standard Phillips curve frameworks when you see a collapse in demand and increase in unemployment. But then in contrast, you show that households and some firms expect the opposite that the pandemic will cause inflation to increase, uh, probably due to some sort of supply side effects related to the shock. So we, as you noted, you've seen this divergence in other periods. So when you've seen this divergence between what households expect and professional forecasters expect, who is right? Who should we put more weight on in the future? So I'll let you start with that when I come back to you, but uh, first let me turn to Constance Hunter from NABE. Hi, thank you very much, Kristen, and thank you for this amazing presentation. Um, so we can see from the last few days that there's a relationship between inflation, expectations, uncertainty, and scarring. And I wonder to what extent you think it makes sense to study how households perceive or anchor to a high increase in cost for certain goods. And it seems that they then uh, assume that that will translate across the economy, whereas us economists look at the inflation basket and the consumption basket when thinking about inflation. And uh, so I think there might be something there in the anchoring that households do when certain individual goods go up and they, they sort of assume that will translate into the full basket. Thank you. Next is Diane Swank from Grant Thornton. Thanks, and I'm actually dovetailing off of Constance's uh, comments, and I appreciate you all. I know you don't want me to thank everyone, but I do appreciate all these. Um, but I, on the issue, dovetailing off of what Constance said, I wondered what you thought the role of inequality and rising inequality is playing in people's perceptions on inflation, and particularly their ability to pay for basic necessities like food and shelter, and how that may have been um, distorted 
uh, more recently in the wake of the COVID crisis and why they might be um, that that might influence their views and how that could play into the communications that the Fed is doing on trying to raise an overshoot on inflation for good reason, for equalizing reasons. But I just wondered what you thought about that inequality aspect on how people value certain things more in terms of what they're paying for. Thank you. And next is Governor Francois from the Banque de France and then Alan Blinder and Jose de Gregorio. Uh, thank you, Yuri's and Olivier's presentation is fascinating and obviously very challenging for our own communication. But let me at this stage accept your hypothesis and focus on your policy recommendations. You recommend that we speak to households and firms about more than inflation. But we do already present a comprehensive economic outlook about output, employment, etc. So what do you mean exactly? Do you mean we should go beyond from, let's say, a holistic description and forecast today to numerical objectives uh, about output and employment, which would raise two serious questions. First, for those of us who don't have a dual mandate. And second, even for those who have a dual mandate, they are not ready to specify a numerical goal for employment, say, Look at what Jay Powell said eloquently yesterday. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we have Alan Blinder from Princeton. Uh, thank you. You're, you know I love this line of work. Uh, I, I want to bring up a, a phrase that got banned in economics a long time ago. Maybe it's making some comeback, and, I, and it relates to your paper, Money Illusion. Uh, you had in the uh, bibliography, but you didn't, of course, mention it, a reference to an old Schiller paper of 25 years ago, which I remember reading and concluding people were just hopelessly confused about inflation. It reminded me of something I put in a book that I wrote 33 years ago, The Coefficient of Robbery, which was the inflation rate divided by the nominal wage increase. That is, people thought they should get whatever nominal wage increase and every point of inflation they were being robbed. Where then that is not, of course, the way we think of it at all. So I wonder whether you think that money illusion goes some considerable way to explaining why people just think inflation is bad news and anything bad gets associated with inflation. Thank you. In a minute, I'll turn to Jose de Gregorio. And since you've been wonderfully succinct, thank you, everyone. I have time to add one more person. Debbie Lucas will be on hold after Jose de Gregorio. So Jose from the Universidad de Chile. Thanks, Christine. This is a great and provocative research, but I, I just have two questions and one small comment. The first question is regarding which forecast is more accurate, professional or households? I would guess professionals, but could it be that forecasters predict CPI while households forecast the true cost of living with a well-known bias? Now, what's really interesting about your research is the sign of the correlation between inflation expectations and activity. And again, the difference between forecasters and households. So my question, who does it better? It seems according to the discussion that household could do better. This leads me to then to my second question, and it's in your surveys of household and firms, the answer about consumption and investment is based on actual data and their perceptions. And, and just to finalize, I like your approach to central bank communication, and this is uh, always the discussion focusing on goals rather than instruments. But I do not think that the central bankers have full control on the emphasis of communication. Usually, in advanced economies, in particular in the U.S., the main concern is the pace of interest rate. But this is market-driven rather than, I think, the purpose of communications, in particular in the U.S. because of its role in the global economy and global asset prices. It's very different in small open economies following flexible inflation time. In general, the inflation forecast is the target because it's a way to conduct monetary policy and to anchor inflation expectations. And hence, the focus of communication is on activity. And indeed, most of the news headlines the days after inflation reports are released is what is the inflation for activity. So my concern regarding your policy proposal is to what extent 
central banks can control the emphasis of communications. Thanks very much. Okay. Thanks very much. And our final comment will come from Debbie Lucas from MIT. Great. I wanted to ask um, people's opinions on how much they think that the levels of debt and um, fiscal policy is also having a role now in driving the particular correlation between inflation um, expectations in the real economy. That is, um, I hear more and more from my acquaintances in business on Wall Street, my students, my friends, that they're concerned that if the economy stays weak and government spending does continue to increase, there really won't be any choice but to monetize the debt. So at least it's a channel I would like to hear um, what people are thinking about. I also thought it was very interesting to see the difference between average inflation expectations between households and forecasters and was interested in hearing more from the author and discussant about how they interpret that difference or what they think the implications of it should be for policy. Thanks very much. Before I turn the floor back to you, let me just pull on a, a theme on a couple of these questions, including Jose's and Debbie's last question. Uh, there seems to be some questions about why household expectations are different. And some of it might come from work I know that Yuri, you have done previously, which shows that when households form their ex uh, inflation expectations, they are more affected by the items they buy daily that are salient, you know, food, oil prices. Those are things that might be more affected by supply shocks. Um, and also, if you look at the uh, basket of what consumers buy, it may be quite different than the basket of goods for the economy as a whole or for companies. Uh, consumers spend a higher share of their income on food, on gas, which are things that would be more affected by negative supply shocks. So could some of the differences you show uh, relate just to differences in what is salient for the different groups or just the construction of their different uh, consumption baskets? So really not as big a surprise when you go under the covers. So now I'll turn it back to you. Yuri, why don't you start? And then George Marios, we'll have you close with the final words. First, I'd like to thank Marios for an excellent discussion. This was really helpful. Um, second, you know, excellent comments from the audience. And I'll try to aggregate and group this uh, comments, questions, suggestions into um, a few buckets. The first one is why we have differences between professional forecasters and households. And as uh, Christian already suggested, it, it's related to the way people, you know, do their purchases, collect and process information, and uh, uh, prices. So frequently purchased goods such as food, gasoline, and so on play a huge role for the formation of expectations for households. And so we should be aware of that. Um, this is also related to why we have this divergence now. Uh, you know, somebody brought uh, this point yesterday, and it came up again today that, uh, you know, the consumption basket during COVID is really different now relative to what it used to be. And this can account for some of the dynamics in uh, inflation expectations on the side of household households. Um, now, who is going to be right about the future inflation dynamics? I will tell professional forecasters typically have uh, smaller forecasters. But, you know, historically, households did, you know, pretty well, too. So I won't discount them completely. Uh, now, the governor uh, of the Bank de France made uh, uh, an interesting uh, question about how we should communicate policy. It's already in the documents and everything. I agree with that, that wealth of information is available to the general public, and they can look up a lot of valuable information from, from the reports, from speeches, and so on. I think the main point we try to make here in the paper is that uh, we already have this information out there, but we just need to change the way we communicate with the general public. And, um, you know, the speech yesterday from the Bank of, um, from the governor of the Bank of Canada uh, made very clear that you know, they're really happy to invest. They want to invest more resources into improving communication with the general public. It has, be, has to be simpler messages, relatable messages. Um, I don't think you should put a specific number for employment, but you can have a general statement like the, the Fed does maximum employment and in general motivate your policies by saying look, we have to have 2% inflation, not just because it's a magic number, but because it really helps with jobs. Uh, in terms of money illusion, uh, Alan Blader had a great question. Um, this is much related to uh, theoretical research done recently by uh, Marius, 
where people can use partial equilibrium equilibrium. And so it's true from partial equilibrium, inflation is a terrible thing, but in general, equilibrium, it may be actually a very valuable thing in the current conditions. So I'll stop here and uh, pass the, the floor. The Thanks screen. very much, George Marios. Thank you. <clears throat> First, I want to comment again, uh, Yuri, Olivier, and the collaborators for doing amazing work in uh, uh, setting a light on how expectations are formed in reality as opposed to our models and how policy communication may influence uh, the formation of expectations. Second, on the key question that was echoed by Christine on uh, the difference between consumers and professional forecasters, I would not doubt that the regular people draw just from their uh, personal experience and they have no clue what is the New Keynesian model and the Phillips curve. And uh, finally, uh, uh, just to repeat something, uh, uh, communication uh, to the general public is very different than communication to uh, financial markets. And also communication during crisis may be very different uh, than communication during normal times. And the context of crisis in the general public, I think what central banks should do is to have a megaphone that speaks only about one thing as opposed to many things. So not talking more than inflation, but rather not talk about inflation, talk only about the things that uh, matter most uh, directly to people's behavior. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yuri and George Marios.